Uh, it's not every day that you receive a letter from an apostle of Christ Jesus by command of God our Saviour and Christ Jesus our hope. Behind this document stands the command of God and of Christ Jesus. Importantly, God the Father who has so commanded is our Saviour. And Christ Jesus our Lord, whose command this is also, is our hope, from whom we've received grace and mercy and peace. And that is, of course, assuming that we share with Timothy, to whom the letter is addressed, in the first instance, the genuine faith of a true child of the Apostle. And the question I left you with was, in what ways do these words call into question how we do or do not treat Scripture? Uh, the introductory words of 1 Timothy uh, have given us a perspective on the character and purpose of Scripture. True, of course, they are giving us a, a perspective on this particular part of Scripture, but the perspective they give us is the very reason that this particular part of Scripture is part of Scripture, and therefore introduce us uh, to a particular perspective on the purpose of Scripture generally. Now, it is at this point that I believe the expositor should deliberately consider the situation of the hearers who will be listening to the exposition of this text. It's always a good idea to begin with yourself, the expositor, for the expositor can hardly expound a text you have not heard well yourself. And the question is, still with 1 Timothy 1 verses 1 and 2, why do I need to hear this text? Why do my hearers need to hear these words? Uh, in the Sunday situation where I'll be attempting to expound 1 Timothy in a few weeks' time, I think that my answer to that question might be a little different from my answer here at Moore College. Here, the reason we need to hear 1 Timothy 1 verses 1 and 2, it seems to me, is that we learn so much from so many sources we can't become familiar with what the scholars say, what the theologians say, what the theologians have said, what the creeds and the councils have said, what confessional statements say. The temptation to lose scripture in the multitude of voices to which we give our attention is a real temptation. All these voices have their place and can do much good but only when we remember that none of them comes to us by command of God our Saviour and Christ Jesus our hope, as this document does. Only then do we keep all the other voices in their right place. There is a danger when we become aware of 2,000 years of reflection and debate that has taken place over the teaching of Scripture of thinking that the Scriptures cannot speak to us directly. It is often said that believers in 2010 must not be so naive. Well, it's not all that often said about 2010, but it's said about whatever year you happen to be in. Should not be so naive, or is it arrogant, as to think that they can read the Bible as though there has not been two millennia of thinking about this book. Is it not ignorant conceit to think that you can read the Bible directly and hear its teaching directly and not through the reflections of the centuries of believers who've preceded us. But I want to suggest that the arrogance is the other way round. The traditions we inherit from our brothers and sisters who have gone before us do not come to us by command of God our Saviour and Christ Jesus our hope. The word that comes to us by divine command must be allowed to stand over the so-called traditions, the theologians, the scholars, and yes, even the creeds and the confessions, as well, of course, as standing over us. This is how God our Saviour and Christ Jesus our hope administer the grace, mercy and peace to us. And it's not good enough for this to be a theoretical statement. You know, the supreme authority of Scripture to be simply a line in our confession of faith, which itself then takes over the role of Scripture. In practice, we must be eager, believing, obedient hearers of the words that have come to us by command of God our Saviour and of Christ Jesus our hope in a way that we hear no other voice. Do you think we need to hear that? Here? Here? 
I'm sure I do. The question is whether the scriptures that have come to us by command of God our Saviour and Christ Jesus our hope actually in practice, in reality, have the place they ought in our lives, in our thinking, and a place that no other voice has, and a place over every other voice. Now I said last week that these would be peculiar expositions, because we're seeking to hear the scriptures ourselves, and we're seeking to reflect on the task of expounding the scriptures as we do it. And I'm not sure whether I'm going to be able to keep this up, but we're having a go. It's certainly been a little bit odd to separate the exposition we heard last week from its application by seven days. Uh, on a later occasion, I want to think a little bit of, with you about how we do what is often called application and how it should be done in a more normal exposition, but that's the way we've done it this time. I'm planning this morning to continue these peculiar expositions uh, and in a sense uh, I feel that I'm inviting you to come with me to my study desk uh, rather a little bit more than to the pulpit. But we come to 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3 and following and at verse 3 the introduction so to speak is over although as you'll very quickly notice the sense of gracious authority that is set in verses 1 and 2 continues. As Paul reminds Timothy of a responsibility he has given the younger man some time earlier and of its gracious purpose. The, um, the importance of what we're about to hear in verse 3 struck me in a rather odd way this week. Uh, in the March issue of Southern Cross, I've written a little piece on the subject of disagreements among Christians. Uh, it's about why we have disagreements and why we should not be surprised that we have disagreements and how we should respond to the disagreements among us. On the cover of the magazine, the article is advertised as, John Woodhouse says, churches must allow dissent. <laughs> now, apart from the fact that the article is about Christians, not churches, it's about disagreements that may arise among us, not dissent, and it's not about allowing or not allowing anything. Apart from that, I suppose it's OK. <laughs> However, having been advertised as one who says churches must allow dissent, you might imagine my delight when I discovered that the words of the apostle, which I have to expound this morning, begin like this. Verse 3, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. Should churches allow dissent? The slogan on the front page of Southern Cross, beside my name, is certainly not one that I endorse. At least not without some serious qualifications. It doesn't, to me, sound as though it's one that the Apostle would endorse. At least he's not endorsing it here. But that does make us rather uncomfortable, doesn't it? I mean, I'm not sure I would have been any happier if Southern Cross people had attributed to me the view that churches must not allow dissent. And I'm not at all sure that we find it easy to get this right. My impression is that Christian ministries could, in a sense, be categorised along these lines. You know, one sort of ministry, all ideas are welcome and nothing is silenced. Or, no one dares disagree with the leadership who always speak with one voice. Now, if we have difficulty with how and when and in what way to allow or not allow dissent in our churches, then I think that is precisely why we should listen carefully to the Apostle this morning. Let me read again from verse 3 and down to verse 7. As I urged you, Timothy, when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of the charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons swerving from these have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying 
or the things about which they make confident assertions. As usual when reading the Bible, the passage before us will not answer all of our questions. That's one of the advantages of Bible exposition as a way of teaching. We don't set the agenda. The Bible often answers questions we're not asking, but perhaps we should be asking. So let's listen to the words of the Apostle of Christ Jesus by command of God our Saviour and Christ Jesus our hope and listen carefully. In verse 3, Paul begins um, by referring to something that he had encouraged Timothy to do some time earlier. You see verse 3, as I urged you when I was going to Macedonia. As it happens, we don't really know, we can't work out, and it doesn't matter very much exactly when this was. Uh, it was a time when Timothy was in Ephesus, um, uh, where Paul, of course, had spent some time, and the gospel had consequently had a huge impact through the whole region. Paul may have been with Timothy at the time, uh, but on his way to Macedonia, or he was somewhere else on his way to Macedonia and he sent a message to Timothy. None of that matters, I, I guess, all that much. But what does matter is what Paul had on that occasion urged Timothy to do. Remain in Ephesus so that you may charge certain people not to teach any different doctrine. Well, that sounds to me like a reasonably difficult assignment. It seems clear that certain persons, known to Paul and Timothy but not to us, were teaching something different from what Paul had taught when he was in Ephesus. To teach any different doctrine translates just one word in the original. It's a compound of the verb to teach and the adjective different. Timothy's task was to command, that's the strength of the word, to charge, to command these persons to stop doing that. Now we may well ask why Paul here restates his instruction to Timothy that he'd given earlier. It could, of course, be just that he wants to make sure that Timothy doesn't forget it or that he understands and appreciates that the apostle still thinks this is important. More probably, however, Paul has the believers in Ephesus in mind who are, as we'll see as we work through this letter, they are expected to hear this letter to Timothy. It's not just a personal private correspondence. It's a letter from the apostle to Timothy that the believers are expected to hear. And as they listen, they are to understand that when Timothy takes steps to silence certain teachers in Ephesus, he's doing it with the backing of the apostle. And we can be sure that what Timothy was doing was unpopular, at least with some. After all, if those who were teaching something different needed to be silenced, they must have had people listening to them. If no one liked what they were teaching, there would be no need to silence them. Furthermore, it seems clear that silencing the different teachers was something that was not achieved in a moment. Timothy had been in Ephesus for some time. We don't know how long, but Paul seems to know that the different teaching was still happening. The believers listening into this letter needed to welcome Timothy's action, support it, acknowledge its importance. He was doing what the apostle had urged him to do. The apostle by command of God our Saviour. The critical question, of course, is what qualified as different doctrine? And the simple answer, even if it's not easy to apply, is different from the teaching of the Apostle. It's not that Timothy was to come down with a heavy hand on any disagreements among the believers themselves with one another. But certain persons were teaching something different from what the Apostle had taught. And Timothy was commanded to stop them. Or Timothy was urged to command them to stop. We can't help but be a little bit curious about what they were teaching. Uh, Paul and Timothy both, no doubt, knew very well what they were saying. The believers in Ephesus would also have known and so there's no need to spell it out, and so we don't know. 
What we hear from the apostle is his definitely uncomplimentary assessment of what they were teaching. That's what this amounted to, uh, in this teaching amounted to in Paul's judgment. So in verse four, 4, Paul reiterates the charge to Timothy that he's to give. They're not to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Well, that's Paul's estimate of the worth of their teaching. Uh, in the New Testament, myths are unreal stories that only gullible people believe and that have no good effect. Um, I doubt myself that the certain persons themselves thought that they were devoting themselves to myths. But that's Paul's estimate. Nor, I suspect, would they think that endless genealogies was a fair representation of their concerns. We don't know exactly what it was that Paul was characterising as myths and endless genealogies. You'll find guesses in the commentaries. I don't think they help us very much. But Paul's estimate of it is what we must hear, for that's what we're given. And it's a massive put down. Myths and interminable genealogies. It doesn't exactly sound like a life-changing, revolutionary, powerful truth, does it? Perhaps more directly helpful to us is to understand from what this teaching differed. The teachings of which Paul is speaking are teachings which promote speculations, he says there in verse 4. Again, I suspect that Paul is putting his own estimate onto what is being described here. Where do these teachings lead? What do they do? Where do they get you? Speculations. Just speculations. It's perfectly obvious that Paul never opposed inquiry and thought, questioning and seeking answers, even controversy and argument. But there is such a thing as empty speculation that gets, never gets any further than speculation. And this teaching is judged to be such by Paul because of the alternative from which it has departed, rather than the stewardship from God. Stewardship is the work entrusted to a steward. A steward is someone who administers something as an agent of someone else. Um, what would the stewardship from God be then? Well, Paul understood himself to be God's steward. This is language he uses of himself in several places. That really is another way of saying an apostle of Christ Jesus by command of God, with the emphasis shifting from the authority that he bears to the task that he's been given. His work of proclaiming Christ Jesus and warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone perfect in Christ, that was the stewardship from God. Uh, Paul adds this typically and tantalisingly brief character characterisation of the stewardship from God, that is by faith or in faith. The human experience within which and for which this stewardship is carried on is faith. This teaching does not lead to empty speculations but to faith. Faith like the true faith of Timothy. It does not matter a great deal that we don't know just what the certain persons were teaching. The main problem lay with the fact that they were not promoting what God had entrusted to Paul. The essential thing about the different teachers is that they were doing something else. Now what is very important to see is why that mattered. That is, what was the purpose of Timothy's censorship in Ephesus, if that's the right and fair word, censoring these certain persons? Well, look at verse 5. Paul says, the aim of the charge, um, if you have an English translation, almost all of them have our charge at that point, which has the effect, it's reasonable in the context, of making t Paul take responsibility for the charge. Uh, that's okay, but the charge that he's speaking about is Timothy's charge. The vocabulary is quite clearly echoing, I think. Uh, it's Timothy's charge to certain persons not to teach differently in verse 3 that he's picking up here. Well, what was the purpose of Timothy's charge, Timothy's command there in Ephesus? What was the, the, the intention of Timothy's censorship of these certain persons? Well, it is, you can see it there, can't you? Verse 
love. Now, how strange does that sound? Timothy is going to silence certain persons from teaching some rather interesting ideas. And the purpose is love. Now, it's easy to imagine that the reaction to his heavy-handed approach, and it must have seemed like that to some at least, would be precisely that he was being unloving. No, says the Apostle. What, Paul, sorry, what Timothy is doing at my urging is directed to love. That's where it's heading. That's its end. Mind you, by love, Paul never meant something merely sentimental and unprincipled. He's talking about love, look at it there, that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. This is what the Apostle's teaching about Christ Jesus aims to effect. This is the work of the Gospel. This is the fruit of this work. We're not talking about pedantic doctrinal purity for the sake of intellectual tidiness. We're not talking about a party line. We're talking about healthy, wholesome teaching that does so much good. It transforms people, this teaching. It cleanses hearts by the wonder of full forgiveness. It clears consciences, again by forgiveness, but also by the assurance of knowing and living by God's grace. It produces sincere, unhypocritical faith, genuine trust in the Saviour and his promises. And from this inner transformation, this purity of heart, this untroubled conscience, this true faith, love, genuine, unselfish, generous love. It's made possible. It's a quality of love that simply does not happen when the heart is still impure and the conscience is still accusing and faith is just pretending. So you see, Timothy is to silence the different teachers so that this love won't be stifled. Now, friends, this is hardly captured by the idea of churches allowing dissent or churches not allowing dissent, is it? It'll take more discernment than that. In verses 6 and 7, we hear a little more about these certain persons and their different teaching. Paul points out four problems with them, which we'll notice just very briefly. Uh, and again, we only have Paul's view of them, of course. First, he says that they've moved away from the goodness of the ap apostolic teaching and its fruits. They're aiming at something else. So you see verse 6, certain persons by swerving from these... That is, from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith that is brought about by the gospel. That is no longer what matters to them. Something else has caught their fancy. Second, they have moved, what they have moved to is worthless in Paul's judgment. They have wandered away into vain discussion. Now again, that's Paul's estimate of what they were on about. Uh, I'm sure they would disagree. But in Paul's view, their talk is pointless. Third, and most tantalising from where we stand, their ambition, verse 7, was desiring to be teachers of the law. This is probably an indication that the teachers were advocating Jewish ideas. It's one of the few hints into the particulars of their teaching. Now, I'm sure that the law that they desired to teach was the law of Moses. That, of course, would have been one of the attractions of these teachers. They were not advocating something obviously godless and pagan. Their concern was with the law God had given his people. However, fourthly, Paul's estimate of them is withering. They were without understanding either in what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Get that at the bottom of an essay, eh? <laughs> faculty take note. <laughs> but it sounds as though Paul would not object so much to people who were teachers of the law if they knew what they were talking about. 
That is, if they knew about grace and mercy and peace, if they knew the way of grace and mercy and peace, but apparently these persons did not. Now, there's a footnote to uh, this passage that we're looking at this morning in verses 8 to 11 that we won't follow through today. We'll pick it up next week. But I want to ask us to reflect on how this word that we've heard this morning should shape us. This brief paragraph, this brief reflection on the charge that Timothy had been urged to give there in Ephesus. For friends, there is always a danger of hearing the word of God in a way that simply confirms where we are. If you are a hardliner who likes to make sure that no one in your church ever speaks or teaches outside your control, perhaps you'll feel confirmed in your approach. After all, Paul urged Timothy to command certain persons not to teach differently. If you're a person who hates hard lines, you might want to emphasise the seriousness of the error that was being silenced here. Without knowing the details, it seems to have been a real departure from the gospel itself, away from faith in Christ, away from love. It's not people who disagree with me that should be silenced, but people who disagree with the apostle. And you might want to say, I would stop that sort of thing if it happened in my church, but I'm glad to say it never has. Well, here's my suggestion. Take a moment to ask not how these words confirm your preferences, your personal disposition, your way, which may or may not be good and right, but at least take the time to ask how and in what ways and to what extent these words call into question your way of thinking, your expectations of what should be happening in the fellowship of believers in Christ. 